All right, Dorpaton. I uh, saw your comments on my page here regarding the eternality of the universe, and um, it's going to take me forever to respond to it in message form, so I'm just going to condense my response into this video. All right, comment number one. None of the science outside of quantum gravity shows the universe began to exist, because science like general relativity and Hubble's law do not take quantum mechanics into account. All right, quantum mechanics does not um, say anything one way or the other about the universe being eternal. Uh, now, quantum gravity necessarily has to exist, and it does say that the universe has to have had a beginning because quantum gravity is necessarily more fundamental than space-time. So once space-time breaks down at the Planck scale during the Planck epoch at the beginning of the Big Bang, there is no space or time. And so if space and time have not been produced yet, well, there isn't any space-time before space-time has been produced. I, before in scare quotes here, sort of. Now, of course, you seem to think that quantum mechanics does produce evidence for an eternal universe. You say, much science from quantum mechanics shows the universe slash multiverse is eternal, including the flat geometry, uh, non-quantum mechanical though, the wheeler dewitt equation, the principle of unitarity, zero-point energy, the vacuum state, the uncertainty principle, density perturbations, and the cosmological constant slash dark energy. All right, I'm going to get to the flat geometry thing in a moment because that's relevant for something I'm going to talk about in a little bit. But let's start with the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. I don't know where you get the idea that the Wheeler-DeWitt equation says that the universe is eternal because the Wheeler-DeWitt equation is actually not quantum mechanics, it's quantum gravity, and it does not say that the universe exists forever. It says that the wave function of the universe is time independent. Okay, what they did is Wheeler and DeWitt, when they tried to calculate the, or set up a, the Wheeler-DeWitt equation is basically a Schrodinger equation a specialized Schrodinger equation to find the wave function of the universe. So when they were deducing the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, what they discovered was that the time-dependent variables dropped out of the equation and left a you know, definition of the wave function which was completely undefined in time. Okay, this is not to say this to say that the universe exists forever in time. It's well, if it's not defined by time, it simply does not even exist in time to exist forever in time in. Now I don't know why you're bringing this up because the wave function of the universe isn't the same as the universe, okay? The universe, or the empirically observable universe, is everything that we can see empirically. In order to get that, though, we have to first collapse the wave function of the universe so that we can have the empirically observable realm that we call the universe. And that's how empirical observables come. They come from wave function collapses. So this, so this actually proves my position and not yours. It means that everything we can empirically observe came from something which is outside of time. All right, and you know, time is a empirical observable, and thus time itself was produced from something outside of time. And if time was produced, well, then it's not eternal. There's not an infinite range of time to exist in. So no, the Wheeler-DeWitt equation is not evidence for an eternal universe. It's actually evidence for a non-eternal universe. All right, then you cite the principle of unitarity. Uh, the flaw with this is that uh, unitarity applies to wave functions. It doesn't apply to actual physical empirical observables, okay? It applies to, it's basically what you know, the other guys out here who are listening to this, uh, unitarity basically means that all the probabilities defined by the wave function have to add up to 100%. But this applies to wave functions and not empirical observables produced by wave functions. And once again, the wave function of the universe is not the same thing as the actual universe. So this is not evidence for an eternal universe as this doesn't even apply to the universe in the first place. Next you cite zero-point energy, the vacuum state, the uncertainty principle, and density perturbations. Now the funny thing here is that you don't seem to realize that this is all the same phenomenon. You cite them as though they're separate evidences when in reality, if you know the connection between them, you would realize that it's describing the same single phenomenon. Uh, for those who don't know what I'm talking about, let me explain. The uh, zero-point energy, is also known as the vacuum state, uh, derived from our knowledge of the uncertainty principle. The uncertainty principle here, or at least the version of the uncertainty principle which is relevant here, basically says that a particle can't have a precise location in time and a precisely defined energy value, uh, and it's they're related by, you, you multiply the two, and the uncertainty in both has to be greater than or equal to h bar over 2. Now this applies to all quantum states. Now the catch with this is, is that people are questioning does it apply to a completely empty quantum state, right? You'd assume that a you'd have a particle which is you have to have some kind of particle which has some kind of uncertainty. The thing is is people are saying let's take all the particles out of something and well it shouldn't apply to just empty space, right? Because it's 
you know, small particles. Well, it turns out that it actually does apply to empty space as well. And so the actual empty vacuum fluctuates around a certain range, you know, around h bar over 2 as well. And this is what we call the zero point energy in the vacuum state. Now, uh, density perturbations are basically quantum fluctuations in this vacuum state that occurred at a time close to the Big Bang, and then the universe expanded outwards, and since then these, because the universe expanded, these fluctuations sort of froze out and gave us the observable matter and energy that we see out in the universe. So now these four th or three things are based on the other thing, the uncertainty principle, and the uncertainty principle says you can't have a precise location in space or a precise point in time for your particle. But now the space and time that these particles are uncertain in was produced during the Planck epoch of the Big Bang, right? So now if space and time aren't yet created, how can particles be uncertain in a space and time which is not yet created? To have uncertainty in space and time, you first have to have space and time, okay? So this, this notion that the universe is somehow eternal because of this is kind of silly because it, it completely bypasses the issue entirely. But I think I pointed this out to you before, Dorpaton, okay? In order to have vacuum energy, you have to first have a vacuum. In order to have vacuum, you have to have space-time. But space-time does not exist until it's created at the Planck epoch. But you seem to have just ignored this and stated these all over again as though they're evidence for an eternal universe, which really, it's not the case. They're, they don't even address the issue. Now the funny thing is is that density perturbations actually uh, suggest a non-eternal universe. There is a article in Physics World back from 2003 that was showing that uh, based on studies of density perturbations they thought the universe was a finite size. Now uh, I mentioned I was going to get into flat geometry here. The model they suggest is that of a hyperdodecahedron which produces the same results as that of a flat geometry of a the article goes further to say that the model they produce uh, produces a universe which is about 30 billion light years across, which fits very nicely when we consider the fact that the universe is constantly expanding with a universe that is 13.7 billion to 14.1 billion years old, not an eternal universe. So our observations of density perturbations actually argue for a non-eternal universe rather than an eternal universe. Lastly, you say that the cosmological constant and dark energy are evidence of an eternal universe. How you can say this completely baffles my mind because if the universe was eternal, dark energy would have everything expanded away so far we couldn't see it anymore. Now, for people who don't know what I'm talking about with dark energy here, about uh, is it 10 years ago now, astronomers discovered that the light closer to us was, more, you know, and thus newer light was more redshifted than light that was farther away. And this means that the expansion of the universe is accelerating as time goes on. Or at least that's one possible interpretation. My personal interpretation is that as the universe gets bigger, larger and larger quantum fluctuations in the vacuum are permitted, and these produce a slight amount of casimir pressure. Remember in that video, Dorpaton, where I was saying that if your model was right and the universe was infinitely big, that it would automatically produce you know, infinitely strong density per you know, casimir forces that would implode everything into black holes. Well, the idea here is that at an earlier stage in the universe, the universe was smaller, and therefore the quantum fluctuations were of shorter wavelength, or thus there weren't as many of them, and they were producing a smaller amount of pressure on stars, and thus a smaller gravitational redshift. So I, I, don't th I think it's actually gravitational redshift rather than uh, motional redshift. The idea then is is that you know trillions of years from now, when the universe gets big enough, these tiny vacuum pressures, I mean, Casimir forces are very tiny, they're going to build up though to such a strong degree that it's going to actually implode everything into black holes, just like I suggested in the video. But the point here is that in either case, whether you know it's the Casimir force pressure I suggested or it's a acceleration and expansion, in either case both of those would argue very strongly against an eternal universe. If the increase in redshift is due to an accelerating expansion and the universe is eternal, well that would mean that by now the redshift would be infinite, and we obviously don't see that. If instead the redshift is due to increases in Casimir forces, well, if we have an infinite universe it's going to give you those infinite Casimir fluctuations, which I argued in my video would shrink everything into black holes instantly. So how you can say that dark energy argues for an eternal universe, this I find this really bizarre. It, it argues the exact opposite. 
Lastly, I'm going to get into your discussion of the holographic principle and why you don't think that it allows me to argue for a non-eternal universe. Okay, let's read here. Your use of the holographic principle in connection with entropy to conclusively claim the universe began to exist is ridiculous and totally in error for four reasons. One, the holographic principle has nothing to do with showing the universe began to exist. Its fundamental purpose is simply to solve the black hole information paradox. You simply misuse it for your own purposes of trying to show the universe began to exist. If you think that's true, then you haven't been keeping up on quantum gravity research at all, because that's not what the physicists are saying. Physicists are saying that we discovered it on the surface of a black hole, and, you know, because of the information paradox, but the principle applies everywhere. Let me read a little excerpt from uh, Brian Greene's new book, uh, The Hidden Reality. But for black holes, we found that the link between information and surface area goes beyond mere numerical counting. There's a concrete sense in which the information is stored on their surfaces. Physicists Leonard Susskind and Gerard de Hooft stress that the lesson should be general. This means it applies to things that are actually not on black holes as well. Okay, This is the whole basis for um, Ted Jacobson's theorem that showed that you can produce regular gravity if you think the universe is holographic and then just add entropy. To say that the holographic principle only works on the surface of black holes is to completely misunderstand the holographic principle. Okay, I, I don't know how you can claim that you know the holographic principle when you don't know this. All right, reason number two. Okay, we say, when you connect it with entropy, there's nothing there. You simply assert that we come to a point where there was no entropy yet produced. No science proves this. You simply assume it. You gotta be kidding me, right? All right, do me a favor and Google search the second law of thermodynamics, okay? Entropy always increases with time, and if the size of an area is related to its entropy, well, this automatically means that as entropy shrinks backwards in time, the space also vanishes to a point. So yes, there is science that actually proves this, okay? And it's not fancy quantum gravity or general relativity or quantum mechanics. It's simply high school level physics, okay? The second law of thermodynamics states that entropy always increases with time. Thus, if we go backwards in time, entropy always decreases. So to say no science proves this is simply blatant ignorance. All right, statement number three. Uh, you say, you refuse to stop misunderstanding what entropy is. You treat entropy like it's some kind of entity when it's a thermodynamic measure of energy. So your whole ploy is focused on the wrong thing. You should strive to get rid of entropy when you needed to show that science confirms energy, which entropy is a measure of at some point, stops being produced, and why it stops being produced and stops existing, why all of it vanishes at a certain point. All right, you say that uh, thermodynamic, uh, entropy is a thermodynamic measure of energy, and that's true on the classical scale, but when physicists are talking about it on the quantum scale, it's a little deeper than that, all right? What it basically is is a measure of the number of possible degrees of freedom that information can hold in the system, right? The number of possible ways you can rearrange information and produce different states out of it. And this generally applies to anything at all, not just, well, everything kind of has energy in it, so everything physical has energy in it, so it would apply to all those systems, but this is a this is a much more general thing physicists are talking about than the regular entropy you normally see with thermodynamics on a classical scale and so forth. As for why energy stops being produced at this level, uh, this is because energy to be produced needs quantum fluctuations, and quantum fluctuations need to exist in space, and if space vanishes to a point, well, there's no energy there. Last me statement for you say your ploy with that also fails since the holographic principle is not the solution, only solution for the black hole information paradox. Uh, you said this several times. I've asked for this other so-called solution. I've I've never seen this, and I've never seen any scientists talking about this. All right, so put this up somewhere, please. You then say in order for you to even begin to use the holographic principle, you have to show that it's a scientific fact. Okay, look, it's not completely 100% proven until we have a full model of quantum gravity. But the fact of the matter is is that all of our major research fields in quantum gravity are pointing in this direction all at the same time, and that's a huge coincidence, okay? It's 99% certain that it's true. And the fact that you're rejecting it like this, this seems really like a, a, a move of desperation on your part. You can pick, like, you know, the 1% of quantum gravity models which may not have the holographic principle in them so that you can rescue your eternal universe model. So maybe I should say instead that it's 99% certain that the universe is not eternal. Okay, but if that's the case, you can't say with certitude that the universe is eternal, okay? You can say maybe 1% chance that it's eternal, but that's it. But face it, that puts you in a really shaky position. Alright, so go do some physics reading, alright? See you guys later.